Dr. Schweiker works in the field of theological ethics. He is the author of dozens of essays and books, including Responsibility and Christian Ethics, Religion and the Human Future, an essay on theological humanism, nominated for the prestigious Grawmeyer Award, and Dust That Breeds, Christian Faith and the New Humanisms. Dr. Schweiker has lectured at universities around the world and been visiting professor at the University of Heidelberg. He enjoys a well-deserved reputation as an excellent teacher. We're fortunate to have him here today. His talk is entitled, Against the Seductions of Transhumanism, Responsibility for the Human Future. Please join me in welcoming William Schweiker. Well, I want to begin with a thanks for the invitation to speak at this event, and particularly to Professor Weaver for her organization and insight into this event. It's an honor for me to be at a conference on a topic that is undoubtedly important in an age when every form of life on this planet can be destroyed, protected, or enhanced through technological power. I'm also thankful that Professor Waters began us in such good stead and I thank each of you for being here today. My task in this lecture is to isolate the seductions of transhumanism and additionally to provide an argument, religious and ethical, for resisting that seductions. I believe that the topic of transhumanism requires a response that is both religious, Christian in my case, and also broadly humanistic. From the perspective of general Christian theological ethics, we are going to see three seductions of transhumanism that have to do first with the logic of responsibility, second with the duties of the responsible life, and finally the aim or good of responsible existence. Transhumanism seeks to reduce human vulnerability through perfecting human capacities it therefore aims, as we've heard in the previous lecture, at a post-human future. Nevertheless, transhumanism still works with some idea or picture of what it means to be human. The defining characteristic of being human for the transhumanist, as we'll see, is the drive or aspiration to overcome our given biological constitution. My reflections move on several broad and yet interrelated planes of reflection. I start by identifying the question posed by transhumanism around human nature. Most of the lecture will then be spent clarifying and responding to the interlocking seductions about the responsible life. I conclude with some reflections meant to provide a Christian account that avoids the seductions of transhumanism. However, any ethics developed with Christian sources must address non-religious transhumanism and also beliefs internal to Christianity itself that back a transhumanist agenda. That is, my argument must be theological and humanist at the same time. My reflections are mainly on the subtitle of this conference, Technology in the Next Humanity, but I will attend to the main title, The Question of God, throughout the lecture. The linchpin of the argument is whether or not we can and should accept the transhumanist conception of human nature and the human good. And I'm going to insist, paradoxically, that Christian faith commits us to being humanists rather than transhumanists or posthumanists. Christian faith is a way of keeping human life truly human. So then, what is the basic question that transhumanism poses about human nature? If one looks around the world, it would appear that virtually every form of life is open to enhancement or endangerment through the use of technological power. We have, for instance, curtailed and eradicated certain diseases, as well as technologically advanced life in many ways. Think of the glasses posed on many of our noses. Against the backdrop, however, of the horrors of the 20th century, mentioned in one of the questions in the previous lecture, and also untold medical experimentation, Leon Cass notes that the threat now is not from the enemies of humanity, but the well-wishers of humanity. And he writes, 
Can we continue to reap the benefits of a new biology and our emergent biotechnologies without eroding our freedom and dignity? What features of our humanity must need defending, both in practice and in thought? What solid ideas of human nature and the human good could be summoned to that cause? Yet the desire, or even imperative, to enhance life is rife in popular culture. Think of the movie Avatar, which has human scientists figuring out how to clone the bodies of the people of Pandora and then transpose the mind of a human subject into that body to physical and moral benefit. Or recall the movie The Matrix, which is a kind of enhancement dystopia, human beings turned into living batteries for machines. Now, the archetype of all of this increasing power in order to enhance life against death is, of course, Frankenstein, or maybe Goethe's Faust, or even further back, the Prometheus myth, or Adam and Eve in the garden. There is something enduring and deep about the human aspiration for what is higher, nobler, greater, through the use of power to overcome, to change, to perfect what and who we are, but also the question of limits, not just technological, but moral limits on enhancement. How do we live between aspiration and limitation, between the pull of ideals of perfection and the affirmation of limits, often painful and death-dealing, of our finitude? This brings us to the question of transhumanism. The challenge, to be blunt, is whether or not it is good to be only human. An initial definition of transhumanism by one of its leading voices, Nick Bostrom, is found, I couldn't resist this, it's found in Wikipedia, uh, <laughs> and it reads as following, quote, transhumanism is the international intellectual and cultural movement that affirms the possibility and desirability of fundamentally transforming the human condition by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging and to greatly enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities. This definition entails some conception of human nature. Technology, they claim, will help us to over overcome the attributes of our natural species, like aging, as well as intellectual, physical, and psychological cap capacities that can be extended, eliminated, or enhanced. In other words, human nature is inherently plastic. It is moldable. So the ageless question of what it means to be human is in our technological context posed in terms of the relation between the vulnerability of human beings, that we are mortal, we can suffer, and yet also the perfectibility of human existence, say through education or the formation of virtuous character, or therapeutic and non-therapeutic means to enhance, to even overcome, our given condition. This simultaneous relation of vulnerability and perfectibility moves us a step closer to the real challenge posed by transhumanism. We must decide if those structures of given humanity are to be lived, even endured, in their tension or, as transhumanism seems to suggest, we ought to reduce vulnerability through the project of perfectibility. That is, to see vulnerability not as a constitutive feature of humanity, without which we would somehow no longer be human, but rather as a limit to be overcome or eliminated. The debate about human nature, then, centers on the character and reach of the human ability to go beyond ourselves to change, to overcome, to live into new and different conditions of life, but also to act for and with others. Human beings can in some way transcend themselves and yet remain themselves. We are in a paradoxical way both continuous and discontinuous with nature, and so beings who through aspiration, action, and labor always exceed our given condition. Put metaphorically, human beings are dust that breathes. That is finite and yet enlivened spirit. We are creatures in between pure dust and pure spirit.
But noting this fact about human being actually conceals a problem. And it is a problem revealed by the agenda of transhumanism. Two options are being played out in popular culture and also in scholarly books and journals. Julian Huxley, biologist and first director of UNESCO, who was the brother of the famous author A Brave New World, is supposedly the first person to coin the term transhumanism. But the transhumanist declaration in its version of two, March 2009 puts the issue much more starkly in its first article. It reads, humanity stands to be profoundly affected by science and technology in the future. We envision the, impos the possibility of broadening human potential by overcoming aging, cognitive shortcomings, involuntary suffering, and here's the line I like, and our confinement to planet Earth. The term or end of human transformation, or transcendence, excuse me, is found in some other non-human realm, say Plato or the coming blogosphere, or within the overcoming of human and yet finite reality, as Nietzsche would conceive the Obermensch, as we heard in the previous lecture. Still others advocate a full-fledged post-human future in which we use technological means to forge what Donna Haraway has called cyborg existence. For these thinkers, despite their profound differences, accepting human lamentation flattens human aspiration to the mundane, it condemns us to the planet Earth, and thus destroys genuine aspiration. On the other hand, some worry that ideals about human perfection alienate human beings from being, to use Martin Heidegger's term, or that aiming too high risks mutilating finite goods needed for human flourishing, as Svetin Todorov has recently argued. The question is how to treasure our vulnerability for these thinkers. As Martha Nussbaum puts it, the temptation of perfection is to despise what is merely human and every day. Despite their differences, the root impulse of these thinkers, ranging from Heidegger to Nussbaum, is to find a home in the world, to note that part of the human good is the very givenness and limitations of life. Now, lest theologians imagine that the transhumanist agenda of perfecting humanity by overcoming vulnerability is nothing but a secular ideology of technological power gone mad, it is important to see that there are Christian versions of this idea. Consider the title of this conference. We should note that children are at one and the same moment vulnerable to the actions of others. After all, does the Heavenly Father protect or chastise his children? And also, children are perfectible. They can learn and develop. The idea of children indicates then on the level of reflection the relation of vulnerability and perfectibility basic to human existence in our age. It can also be taken, say in St. Paul's term, as an injunction. Christians should overcome their infancy into the full stature of Christ. What is more, at least some Christians, for some Christians, the final destiny of human life is friendship with God. The beatific vision is Aquinas conceived the perfection of human life. This is not the destruction of nature, but its perfection into a new form or mode of being. Other theologians accent the discontinuity rather than the continuity between nature and redeemed nature like Aquinas does. Recently, the theologian Catherine Tanner has insisted on grace without nature. And this means focusing on the plasticity and radical transformability of human beings to be remade, reworked into the image of God by Christ. In Christ, we become, it would seem, post-human. There is a radical discontinuity between natural and redeemed existence, sense to be precise. In Tanner's vision of the Christian witness, human beings do not really have a nature. In other words, some Christian conceptions of redemption and transformation are themselves or could be read as forms of transhumanism made possible by grace in word and sacrament. 
Now, it must be said that the current technological possibilities of enhancing life seem to confound the debate I just noted. With the increase of technological power to intervene and alter basic forms of life, from the genetic to the environmental, the distinction between the natural and the artificial is lost. And this confuses the debate. Since one, it seems, despite what Leo Leon Cass argued, to mean that we need to find the norms for responsible action without appeal to human nature. And yet second, that human power, against what Bostrom and Tanner have argued, must acknowledge forms of life that constrain action because of their vulnerability to and by human power. We need an ethics that grounds moral duties in something other than an appeal to human nature, but one that finds the ethical aim of life in the integrity of different forms of life endangered by technological power. It looks like we both we want our cake and to eat it as well. We want appeals to nature and ethics, and yet we don't want them. Can ethics have it both ways? That question sets the agenda for the rest of this lecture. The insight is to grasp that human transcendence is intrinsically bound to responsibility for uh, respecting and enhancing the integrity of life, including human life. This endorses vulnerability as a limit on perfectibility and a good limit as well. Affirming the vulnerabilities of life as ingredient to what it means to be responsible entails a claim about being human. The philosopher Paul Ricoeur makes the point, quote, man is man, you have to pardon the old language here, man is man when he knows that he is only man. The ancients called man mortal. This remembrance of death indicated in the very name of man introduces the reference to a limit at the very heart of the affirmation of man himself. Faced with the pretense of absolute knowledge, humanism is therefore the indication of an only. We are only men. The root question, again, is whether or not, morally and religiously, it is good to be only human. The answer is yes, I think, and it reinstates the demand for a form of humanism, and the kind of humanism it entails will become clear, I hope, at the last step of these reflections. So let me turn now to the seductions of transhumanism. This only should take about four or five hours. <laughs> My claim so far has been that at the root of the debate about technology and the next humanity are conflicting accounts of human being. One side of the debate holds that our vulnerabilities, that we are dust, are the condition of perfectibility, and that through technological and religious means, we can overcome, transcend human nature into a post-human future. Somehow, we will no longer be only human. The other side of the debate insists that human vulnerability is a limit on perfectibility, and a good one as well. My own account requires that we see human transcendence in terms of responsibility for the integrity of life. The position I advance requires that any act to enhance life must first meet the neat demands of moral respect. And finally, ethics must begin with awareness of vulnerability of the integrity of human life to the workings of power in its conception of the good. That is how I'm going to want to have my cake and to eat it too. In order to bring some precision to those reflections, we need to isolate these seductions of transhumanism. One a seduction of transhumanism is logical. It goes like this. If, through technological means, we can extend life, then we ought to do so. There are only two constraints on this logic that can implies ought. The limit on technological Enhancement is first, an individual's right to choose, to refuse the use of life extending or capacity enhancing technologies, and two, a good probability that the technology will actually work and therefore enhance their lives, their well-being. The question of what, how to define well-being is, is a crucial question to address, and I'll return to it in just a moment. 
But here is the nub of the first seduction, the appeal to choice as one of the limiting conditions on the logic of can implies ought, actually conceals the reason why that logic is false. The choice to use life-enhancing technology actually involves distinct relations that are marked not by equality and freedom, but by imbalances of power. The self in relation to itself, and the self in relation to others, including future others. Given this fact, who is choosing and for whom? The relations of power show the, the, that the appeal to individual choice in order to limit the use of technologies is confused. How so? Well, I have power over my body, for instance. I am additionally vulnerable to the power of others who can harm or help me, physically as well as sociologically and psychologically. But others are vulnerable to me in various ways. Furthermore, who I am, my identity, is vulnerable to my body. I assure you that I cannot play soccer like I did when I was a much younger man, and that has changed my self-understanding for the worse, I think. In other words, we exist in relations of power that the logic of transhumanism conceals or distorts. The act of choice is not my free disposal over myself since my se sense of self involves different <coughs> relations of power. These relations of power are either moral or ethical relation, relations, and that's what the logic of transhumanism conceals. Morality has to do with relations and actions that can inflict unwarranted suffering. The ethical is about the ends or goods of well-being that we can and should seek. Technological power, even if freely chosen, can inflict unwarranted suffering and thus be immoral, as well as distort and impede the attaining of well-being and thus be unethical. Now, if we are aware of the asymmetrical relations of power concealed in the talk about choice, then with respect to the moral use of technologies, there is necessarily the formula ought implies can rather than can implies ought. But interestingly, the principle ought implies can means something very different than what it, how it was formulated by the great modern thinkers of freedom, like Immanuel Kant. In our technological age, the relations of power place constraints on possible courses of actions and policies. In terms that I used before, we have to ground the realm of duties in something other than the idea of human nature, and it is grounded in the character of asymmetrical relations of power, since we must not inflict suffering in the belief that might makes right, or that the end justifies the means. The inability to grasp that insight, that one should not inflict power on the innocent and the weaker, the inability to grasp that insight is a profound moral and ethical blindness. And the truth is, of course, that we live in cultures of moral blindness. Jürgen Habermas, the philosopher, put it this way. There is a reversibility of obligations because agents as persons are due the same moral consideration and ought to relate to each other in mutual recognition and equal regard. What is demanded of me? is also demanded of you. Yet the act of enhancing current life in ways that deprive future human beings the determination of their own lives actually makes their choices, even choices technologically to enhance their lives, to depend on the choices, and therefore the power, of present persons. It asserts the power of present persons over future persons so that it makes right equals might, the ends justify the means. Such actions deny reversibility and are therefore immoral and unethical. Now the complaint that we are dependent on the irreversible and asymmetrical power relation to our parents, since they brought us into being, is no counter argument. That relation is a biological one rather than a moral and ethical relation 
which can paternalistically revoke the biological relation. In other words, in the light of technological power, ought implies can is not a form of the condition for moral freedom, as Kant argued, but the intersubjective limit imposed by asymmetrical relations of power and the demand for valid moral and ethical relations that are symmetrical. Now, this argument for insisting on the priority of the formula ought implies can rather than can implies ought is rooted ultimately then in beliefs about the equal status of persons, present and future, and their rights and duties. It also means that there is a priority to the demand to respect others over the requirement to enhance life. Ought implies can, therefore, takes on other meanings in our technological age. The basic duty of the responsible life cannot be always and everywhere to increase human power. The formula ought implies can means that the end sought is constrained by the integrity of life in situations of asymmetrical power such that the ends does not justify the means. Of course, these two points demand further argument, both philosophical and theological. And so I'm going to move from the first logical seduction to the second, which is about the content of duties of the responsible life. Respect and enhance. I want to unpack these concepts. They may help us think about borderline cases. Now, respect is a concept that specifies the attitude towards or acknowledgement of the moral standing of some being that focuses on recognition and non-intervention. It is keyed to a sense of dignity. Respect is the posture, attitude, or sensibility one can and should take to others that is keyed to the dignity of their existence. Together, this package, respect and dignity, aims to articulate the moral standing and considerability of self and other. Packaged into the sensibility of respect is the recognition of dignity. And on this account, ethical theories that look to people's moral intuitions or attitudes or feelings are misplaced as much as those theories that look to specify dignity without any reference to our moral feelings or sensibility. The trick is to keep both sides in play. Concepts for what we are responding to, not reducible to our reactions, concept dignity, but also the psychological dynamics at play in moral relations, the sensibility of respect. What about enhancement? Well, this is actually an underexplored and under-theorized <laughs> concept. Linguistically, its roots are in terms that mean to rise, to lift, to augment, to increase, to elevate. To enhance something is to have the sense that one should make that thing, whatever it is, better, greater, in some definable way. But what is not clear is what its <coughs> correlate idea might be. Whereas respect is correlate to dignity of another who evokes our respect, what about enhancement? It would seem on the face of it that it is either the vulnerability or the perfectibility of something or state of affairs form of life. In other words, and this is very confused, the sense that we ought to enhance life is correlated both to life's vulnerability and its perfectibility. The sense that we ought to enhance life does not help us distinguish between vulnerability and perfectibility, and that is very dangerous. That is, if the correlate of enhancement is perfectibility, then the vulnerability of others to our power puts no limits on what we can rightly do with them or for them. Yet if vulnerability is correlated to the duty to enhance, it is not clear that we should wish technological means to aid others over whom we have power. So at the very core of the transhumanist agenda is a massive and confusing ambiguity, which is it correlate to. And to say, as Bostrom did, that the limit on enhancing life is free choice of individuals to forswear the use of technologies, therapeutic or non-therapeutic, is simply to miss the point. As I've noted, we experience vulnerability and perfectibility in relationship to ourselves and our bodies, 
the appeal to choice masks the fact rather than providing moral guidance. Now, the ambiguity about the correlate to enhancement as both vulnerability and perfectibility is the issue. And this explains why therapeutic intervention, which begins with vulnerability and then moves to perfectibility, is hard to sort out from non-therapeutic intervention, which begins with the possibility of perfecting and only then, if at all, acknowledges human vulnerability. This is this instability in the basic ethical sense that we should make life better, which we should enhance life wherever we can, is the root issue. And if that's right, at least at a simple descriptive level, then we can see why in our time the question of enhancing life has become so confused. Let me put the my own judgment on this rather boldly. The radical increase of technological power and the ambiguity in the moral sense that we should enhance life means that the moral demand for respect must have priority over the ethical project of enhancement. This requires seeing vulnerability as a limit on the drive for perfection and both forms of enhancement in the service of dignity and respect. Now, there's ancient wisdom in this judgment. Throughout the ages, Christian thinkers have insisted that duties of non-malevolence, that is, do no harm, must take priority over duties of benevolence and beneficence. While we should do all we can to promote life and to tend to the needs of others, there is a prior demand, if we think of the Ten Commandments, not to kill, not to steal. The end does not justify the means. Might does not make right. Now, I'm profoundly aware how hard it is to make this argument in a culture that assumes that the end does justify the means, that if we can, then we ought, and that to act otherwise seems somehow uncaring, even anti-human. After all, if we can save future babies from disease by genetically altering sperm and egg, why not? If we can overcome the threat of senility by uploading brains into computers, why not? But in order to see the reason why we must give priority of respect over enhancement as moral duties, realizing that we need them both, but they're in their right order, leads to the crucial question noted about the aim or good of responsible life. <clears throat> and therefore, I turn to the third seduction on the human good. We know the good of transhumanism, as noted before, quote, it envisions possibilities of broadening human potential by overcoming aging, cognitive shortcomings, involuntary suffering, and our confinement to planet Earth. The seduction is to believe that that's an adequate account of the human good. Is it the case? It's important to note that human action and freedom is entangled with the vitalities and needs of our forms of life as we strive for some integration and integrity in our lives and communities. The good which human action and relation should respect and enhance, I call the integrity of life. And I mean two distinct things or interrelated things by this concept. First, integrity designates the integration or drawing together of a range of goods sufficient to fulfill basic needs and express capacities necessary for a form of life to continue to exist, to resist death. The range of kinds of goods different for the type of life considered, its species life. A human being has needs and capacities for reflection and meaning missing at other organic levels of life, even as human beings no less than cells or animals, must metabolize energy through interaction and communication with its environments or the interaction among environments. In each case, some kind of integration is enacted. And the analogical use of the idea of life across diverse types is, thereby, is therefore rooted in this dynamic of integration. The main threat to any form of life is disintegration the weakening of the life process to the point of non-being or death. Yet even the concept death 
is analogically predicated of beings owing to the diverse ways they integrate their lives. And this is why, as Christians have long known, human beings can die in many different ways. Physical death, social death through the disintegration of communities, existential death in the loss of meaning and purpose of life, spiritual death, or the denial of the integrity of one's life in God's life. So too, one can be physically alive and spiritually dead, existentially alive and yet physically dying. The mark of finite life, in contrast to divine life, is that the capacity for integration is never complete. And in time, it is either destroyed or dissipates to the point of disintegration and therefore of death in its many forms. What we mean by good and evil on this first level of integrity are the relations and actions that enhance or thwart the integration of life among beings. Integrity in the second, related sense, denotes moral or spiritual goodness. A life of moral integrity is one that is integrated not simply in terms of the range of goods that, need, that um, must be met, but more radically through a project of respecting and enhancing those goods in, with, and for others. Moral integrity arises not with the brute awareness of the power to integrate life, it is an attitude for the exercise of capacities for action in, with, and for others, wherein the power to act is deployed to respect and enhance, not to demean or destroy the integrity of lives. It is the self-limitation of power arising from respect for the dignity and the vulnerability of others. Now, human beings exist within this interrelated senses we've noted, the integration of goods and forces against the, demand, the, the possibility of disintegration and death, as well as the call to moral or spiritual integrity. That's how we're both dust that breathes. And now we've returned to Paul Ricoeur's warning that we are only human, but in a different way. Yes, we are only human, only dust that breathes, who must live with the tensions at the core of our being. Yet in the same sense, only human beings can respond to their limitations and vulnerabilities by acting with and for others on earth and in time. Only human beings can be responsible here and now for the future of finite life without the need to overcome our confinement to planet earth. In fact, human transcendence is found in responsibility for not confinement to life on this endangered planet. Now the argument I've just outlined, namely that human transcendence is found through responsibility with and for others on earth and in time, does not stand alone. In order to make it stick, we have to make another shift to a different plane of reflection. And this is the theological plane. So one matter needs yet to be addressed. Why should we accept and even embrace the fact that we are only human? As far as I can tell, despite Paul Ricoeur's claims to the contrary, there is nothing within humanism itself that can answer that question. Yes, we are mortal and have etched into our being the remembrance of death. Yet why ought that remembrance be embraced within our affirmation of life? Put more forcefully, why should our love of life and the desire we all have for more life and that our loved ones should have more life, why should it accept that we are only human? And it is here that Christian faith ironically commits us to a kind of humanism, but one whose maxim is that we are called to be human truly human. It answers the question of humanism in its own way, and explaining this point concludes my reflections. The biblical texts formulate the moral law of life that is the proper limit on human power and asymmetrical relations in terms of the complex relation between the command to love God with one's whole heart, strength, and mind, and one's neighbor as oneself. 
The self-evident force of this maxim is found not in our mortality and power to, or the vulnerability of others. As St. Augustine and many others rightly noted, in every love, what is co-loved is God, the living God. And that insight must be formulated not only as a type of humanism, but also as a kind of piety, a religious longing. It indicates a kind of theological humanism. So in loving others, we are co-loving the divine. But that's not enough. One ought not to efface human and celebrate human vitalities through exclusive attention to the love of God. The claim of the Christian message is that God, who is loved in our acts of love, is also the power of life, and yet has been manifested in time on earth in the human Christ, a power made perfect in service of others. And therefore, St. Paul, in Galatians 5.13, radicalizes in the direction of a humanist insight the double love command. For he writes, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Once life is seen in Christ, then the double love command is intensified in the direction of love for the human other as the limit on both human and divine power. This requires that Christian theological humanism articulate itself through predicates borrowed from Christological formula. As I put it, one is called to be human, truly human, in the freedom of love, just as Christ is true God and true man. Christian faith is not about the plasticity of human beings to be remade in the image of God, as Tanner argued. This faith is about the power of divine love in mortal existence in such a way that we can and may be truly human without denial or hatred of the fact that we are also only the form of human transcendence, then, is responsibility for the integrity of life with and for others on earth and in time. But this is merely to say that responsibility is the form Christian love takes in the domain of our mortal existence. My point is that a type of humanism is possible, ironically enough, when the limit on human power is not simply the sting of mortality, or free choice to use or not use enhancing technologies, but much more the longing for the divine on earth and in time with and for others. Once this longing, itself an attestation and struggle, finds rep representation in the biblical witness, the limit on human power is the transformation of power into service and love to others as oneself. Here is enacted, in a way contrary to transhumanism, a perfection of human existence. This possibility manifested in Christ is the claim of the Christian conscience that seeks not to escape confinement to planet Earth, but rather to grasp the full transcendence of human existence as the responsibility for the integrity of life. Now, someone might ask me as I conclude, which I'm sure you're happy to hear, how this response to the seductions of transhumanism that has worked through logical, normative, and finally theological levels, how it would be possible for non-Christians to endorse this. But giving that demonstration has actually been one purpose of this lecture. One can accept the arguments I have forwarded morally, ethically, and logically against transhumanism without necessarily being Christian. What I have shown is how, Christ, is how Christians can and ought to join with other responsible people to forge a humane and responsible ethics in order to counter those seductions of transhumanism while also combat, combating transhumanist ideas within their own tradition, which is what I've also done. I can leave it to faithful people in other traditions to attempt the same kind of argument for their communities while asking non-religious people simply to affirm 
shared ethical insights. And in this way, we might secure some common ground in working for a truly human future. Thank you very much. Certain steps get lost or missed. Um, I'm proceeding to use technical terms phenomenologically. I'm trying to ask what is the experience of respect? How do we unpack that to see what its correlate concept is so that we don't reduce ethics just to our feelings or do we assume that somehow we can talk about the moral standing of others <coughs> divorced from our feelings, our moral feelings? So the lecture was trying to unpack two couplets, respect and dignity, I'll come back in a moment, and then to show that the moral sense that we should enhance life itself is inherently ambiguous about its correlate, and that's why we see the public debate working out the way it is, okay? Now with respect to respect, um, here my guide is Immanuel Kant. He understood respect through the German term, Achtung which means that for him, when you encounter another human being, there's something in them that calls you to attention. It rips you out of your normal way of seeing things as objects to be used. He thought that reality, the dignity in the human, that evokes this notion of respect, which I assume we've all had that experience, right? Um, that our own narcissism is shattered by the claim of another human being on one side. Uh, he thought dignity was keyed to freedom, to the rational capacity to make choices. I'm trying to shift that argument to where it has to do with the awareness of the vulnerability of another human being and my vulnerability to them in relations of power. Then the question becomes, and I can follow up in my getting your concerns so far, then the question becomes, okay, great. Schweiker, wonderful. We have respect and dignity, dignity understood in terms of these questions, this, this vulnerability to the power of others. So what? Well, what I tried to do is to show the place of that concept and experience within an imperative. Respect and enhance the integrity of life before God is the full imperative. And that imperative does not answer all of our moral questions but it gives us guidance because it shows that we ought not to enhance things until they have first been respected. What counts as respect and dignity would, rest, would be a sort of case-by-case -case determination. Um, there's a number of reasons why I think that must be the case, but that, that's where this will end up. So I'm trying to provide a, a general framework within which we can address these more specific ones. Am I getting to your concern at all? These are very, we don't think enough about the density of moral sensibilities. And that's what I'm trying to do, unpack the, the, the sensibilities. Yes. Uh, thank you. And uh, your per perfect ability and uh, also vulnerability, uh, but your assumption based on human being is subject towards nature, or human individuality, subjectivity, a kind of assumption. So my question is that uh, how about the uh, dignity of the nature? Uh, 
vulnerability of nature, how human be responsible to the nature. Uh, this is, a, is there any come from Christian tradition or non-European tradition, or we have to find out another tradition? I'm not sure I quite hear the question, but it has to do with what is the status, status of the natural realm um, with respect to this argument. I can easily do that. Ah, I'm supposed to stand over here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, this, is, this is actually why I formulated everything in terms of the integrity of life, not the integrity of human life. Part of what, and I went through the levels of integration that must go on, and the relation and yet difference between human beings and other forms of life. So the question, and this is the force also of the claim, that our distinctive form of transcendence our distinctive way of being in the world while also going beyond it is not found in some platonic realm. It's not found in the coming Ubermensch. It's not found in a transhumanist future. It's found in responsibility for the integrity of all life. Right? So I don't, it, now, is that a Christian idea? I don't know. I, I tried to work with a basic conception of life that's fairly biological. It's how entities integrate their needs and capacities in relationships to communication with environments. Uh, I think the Christian tradition has a particular take on that, but I'm not initially using a Christian conception of life. Am I even getting to your concern or not? A uh, particular uh, responsibility to the universe, responsibility of the nature. This is uh, my question. Okay. Responsibility is correlate to power. If you do not have the power to affect something, you cannot be responsible for your actions or it. I'm trying to suggest that the technological age now makes us responsible for life on this planet. But we don't have the power to worry about black holes and quarks and other universes. Uh, responsive, and that's one of the reasons why I like the discourse of responsibility and have developed it theoretically, is it's correlate to the question of power. right? I don't know what it would mean to say you're responsible for future universes. I have no idea what that could possibly mean. Maybe in some thought form one could develop that. I have some notions of karma, for instance, uh, so that actions, collective actions, bring, bring about new universes. But I'd have a very difficult time thinking that through in terms of the demands of contemporary ethics. Right. So responsibility and power are correlate concepts. And then as I'm packing, what that might mean. Is that getting to your question? Others? Clear as mud, but that covers the ground, as they say. <laughs> yeah, I just had a quick thought that um, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount teaches respect. You know, if you hate your brother without a cause, yeah. you're a murderer. If you lust yeah. after a woman, you're an adulterer, that yeah. sort of thing. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, uh, what I'm calling the humanistic commitments of Christian faith have usually been unfortunately underplayed. I mean, Jesus says the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath, which is a fairly radical thing to say. So um, I'm trying to lift up those elements of this tradition in order to combat what I see are distortions that the tradition could feed into, not only transhumanism, but other distortions as well. And I think that's the job of religious thinkers in our age. If you open the morning newspaper, you see what happens when religious traditions don't transform themselves. You have pastors in Florida burning Qurans, and folks in Afghanistan killing innocent people. Right? So I think it's the duty of religious thinkers to transform, to read out the viciousness and short-sightedness of their traditions by their most humane insights, which is what I was trying to do in the Sermon on the Mount is one of the key places for that. If, Go if once. there isn't someone here, actually, I wouldn't mind having you elaborate on why you think that what it means to enact respect has to proceed on a case-by-case -case basis. Oh, just the meaning of what that would entail. Yes. So, for instance, um, It's not absolutely clear in a situation, particularly a medical situation where there may be conflicting family desires and needs, 
how you could come in with a preset notion of what it would mean to respect the patient's life. So one would want and one would hope that physicians would sit down and think about this. Um, and that even as procedures are going on, there can be a reassessment. What I've tried, the limits I've tried to put on the notion, on the, the, the content I've tried to build into respect is first, it's this deep sense and acknowledgement um, and recognition of their dignity. And then within that, it's that dignity is inseparable from their vulnerability. Okay? Um, and then I think you'd have to think that through in specific cases because there are different agents making decisions. This is where I find you know, the appeal to just simple choice to be very dangerous as ways I tried to put it. Is that Just briefly, I wasn't tracking fast enough to get your reference to this. <laughs> Did I speak faster? <laughs> yeah, this happens from time to time. Um, you mentioned the spectrum from Heidegger to Nussbaum, and uh, it has to do with uh, this idea of um, um, a species being, or, or uh, that. I was, with the argument I was making, I made reference to three thinkers, very different, um, and I'll show you what they share. Uh, they share two things. One is a worry that specific ideals alienate us from our creatureliness and our earthliness. So Martin Heidegger in his famous essay on technology is basic, making basic that, that argument and wants to see human beings as what he calls shepherds of being. To see ourselves as shepherds over reality. Okay? Tzvetan Todorov, another thinker who's written a recent book on humanism, argues that high ideals, such as perfecting humanity endlessly, can mutilate or destroy basic goods of life, and therefore is immoral. Martha Nussbaum, in her examination of the moral feeling of disgust, actually, um, worries that we, in these kinds of arguments, transhumanist arguments and others, were manifesting a kind of repugnance or disgust over our finitude and that we have to counter that. What all three of these thinkers share is that they want to make us at home in the world. They want to make us accept our finitude, okay? Which is very against the second option. And I'm trying to make an argument that's weaving down the middle. Respect, we should accept our being on Earth. Enhance, we also have ideals and aspirations we should pursue. Is that getting to your... Well, we've got, got a question back here, or you can come back if you have another. Do you want to ask more, or are you? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I just want to thank you for putting the, uh, elucidating this idea of power into um, the biological and genetic enhancement. Right. My com I, I'm not sure what my comment is. I think it's probably better taken offline, but I will comment on uh, a conference that I attended just this weekend uh, that dealt with ethical in issues in genetic enhancement and other <coughs> bioengineering. Um, one of them has to do with the social good the, uh, of the potential for uh, <coughs> genetic enhancements, or it's, it's, and it's not even genetics, human enhancement uh, of all. Uh, over the personal over personal autonomy. So I'll restrict my question to dealing with the issue of what you're talking about, dignity, the human person, and personal autonomy. And, um, with the ability to identify individuals' characteristics through uh, DNA coding, there is a sense of a loss of, it is, and it's almost becoming an assumption that human individual's dignity no longer exists or yeah. need exist or is anachronistic in some way. Right. And so, so I'll, I would just ask you to comment on Yeah, that. very good. And I, I'm a real proponent of human individual dignity. I think that's part of what a humanist commitment is, entails. We like, well, I was going to say we like human beings. I think that's a little <laughs> <laughs> we are committed in principle. <laughs> to, uh, in the more extended argument of this that I've developed in several books, we have interlocking levels of goods that all must be integrated. 
So there are bodily goods, there are goods of locality, there are social goods, there are reflexive goods, and there are moral goods or spiritual goods. Um, and the person of integrity is committed to respecting, enhancing the integration of all those goods uh, in human individuals and communities. Right? Now, this is something we never completely succeed at. That's why it's a moral norm. If we completely succeeded at it, we wouldn't need a moral norm. We would just be living normally. Now, under that picture, the idea that you could have communal goods that violated individual goods is incoherent or that you could have individual goods that were not themselves part of the social good would also be incoherent. So the question is how to think through the interrelationship between these. My argument about respect and enhance implies also a relation of the individual to the community. The community must first respect individual life before it decides to enhance human existence for the good of the social whole. Right? In the same way, an individual must think about their duties and obligations, what do they respect in a community uh, as the ground purpose for, or ground duty for deciding what they need to do to try to enhance their own life and others. Um, is this, I think this is getting at your concern. It's how to interrelate these things. Uh, it's, it's so complicated that I would say that one of the responses that I heard uh, over this conference was, not today, but before, was that, um, the very act of pushing technology and technological capacity to its limit is, in fact, the ultimate respect of what it means to be human. The ultimate act of respect of human because we are the only right. species capable of doing that. Right. That's why, in the argument I presented, I tried to show that the transhumanist argument says we should enhance life, couples that to perfectibility, not to vulnerability. And because it's coupled to perfectibility, then respect means changing us into another form of life. Right? That's why this ambiguity between vulnerability and perfectibility is so important to decode. My counter argument is no, 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 no. Um, we have to start with vulnerability and 